looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open to Romans chapter 13. If you didn't come with a Bible, maybe you can use one on your smartphone or tablet. You can certainly look at one that's uh, there in the uh, chair. You might pick one up there as well. But while you're turning to Romans 13, you might say, well, you're going to preach your message. What is Paul's message in all of this? Well, I think it's a very apropos message because it's coming in a portion of Scripture where Paul wrote this very long Magna Carta of the Christian faith to a group of believers, a church in Rome, not the Catholic Church in Rome, but the New Testament New Believer Church that began hundreds of years before the Catholic Church got launched. So that being the case, he then wrote them this letter. The first 11 chapters, he said, you need to get right with the Lord Jesus Christ regarding your salvation, your security in Christ, and your sanctification, which means being separated and live unto the Lord. And then in chapter 12, he says, therefore, now that you're in Christ, he now says, consecrate your life to the Lord. So have a right relationship with God Almighty, not just Christ, but see the Trinity in all of this. Then he says, now, if you have a right relationship with the Lord and God, then what you do, have a right relationship with the church. So then he taught about learning your spiritual gift and then using that special ability that he's given to you to help build up other people for the glory of God and grow his church. But he said also, you have to have a right relationship with other people in general, whether they're part of your church or not. And then he threw in that little nasty word, enemies, that all of us are going to have people that will press up against us that won't see life or the word of God or the way we believe Christianity ought to be. And they'll come against us for some reason. They're our enemies. He talked about how to have a right relationship with them. And then remember, he's writing to new believers in a particular governmental system in Rome And now he taught those Christians on how to have a right relationship with government. And that was a wonderful study we've had. Well, now he pauses and he says, all right, now that I've got that to you, now I want to talk about how to have a right relationship, frankly, with yourself. Now, that's where we're going. Make the rest of my life the best of my life by having a right relationship with the way I personally do things. But we have to look at it from a season. And if you will, for just a moment, I'm going to kind of go in the middle of my notes and just show you one little verse so you know where we're going, how that this is kind of hanging on this bedrock principle. So look at Romans chapter uh, 13 again, but I want you to drop down. We're going to go through 8 through verse 14, but I want you to look at verse 11. He says this, knowing this, or do this, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us than we believe. So he's basically saying, you've trusted Christ as Savior, and you might have done that a few years ago. That means you're closer to being glorified. You're closer to being in heaven than you were before, because every day you're closer to going to heaven. We like to say we're not um, looking for the undertaker. We're looking for the upper taker who's going to take us up to heaven here, and that's going to be closer and closer. So as you look to the future now, what are you going to do differently? Now pause for a moment. You know what your next season in life is going to be. Not all what it's going to be, but you know it's going to be different. What are you willing to partner with God on and allow the Lord to bring out from within you the things so that you can have a better life as you go into this new season? He's given you a spiritual golden opportunity to make things different. When Carol and I had our boys living in our home, there were some benchmarks in our life that we would make some major changes. It often occurred at the end of summer but before school would start. And then we would then start school new with some new things going on in our house. New disciplines, new habits, new directions, new decisions. And we would begin to fill our calendar with the things that would help our boys to grow up to become fully devoted followers of Christ. So we used seasons to look forward to. Because we knew, as all of you do know, that kids don't last very long in our house, do they? Pretty soon they just have a habit of growing up and going on, you know? Well, that being the case, we wanted to take advantage of every opportunity that we had. Now, with all of that in mind, I really believe you can engage on these six areas that might really help you, again, to have the rest of your life the best of your life. So let's look at number one. The first one would be to pay up, to really pay up. And let's see what that says in Scripture. Back to Romans 13. Just look at the first part of it. It says, owe nothing to anyone. And then we'll get to the rest of the verse in a moment. But it says, owe nothing to anyone. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be totally out of debt. 
But it does mean that you're not behind on your bill paying. You're not behind on the obligations that you have. So in a sense, you really don't owe them because you've made an agreement to pay at a certain time, a certain amount, and you're not dilatory in any of that. You're right on schedule. Now, if you want, I think it might still be wise to keep going in the direction of becoming debt-free. You all will agree it doesn't take much to understand that even though we might have some debt, it's still ultimately better to be debt-free to get out of debt. So maybe for the rest of your life, you know it's coming up and you want to have the best of your life, it might be good for you to make some of the hard decisions and how you're going to use your money. There's three things you might want to keep in mind, and that is how do you get money? In other words, if you want to owe nothing to anyone and you want to march toward debt-free, you want to ask yourself, how do I really get my money? How do I get it? It's through hard work. It's through diligent spending. It's through proper prayer. And maybe some ways God will miraculously give you that. So I promise you that God will provide for you as a Christian if you seek first the kingdom of God. So how do you become debt-free and owe no man nothing? And that is, look to the ways that you receive your money and thank God for every one of those and take advantage of for every opportunity he gives for you to continue to bring in through multiple streams of income more money. But that's just part of it. The other part of it is once you get that money, you can easily get rid of it, but you don't want to do that. What you want to do then is you want to guard that money. If you remember a long time ago, I gave a message and I used a bucket up here. A lot of money is going like water into the top of that bucket. And some of you have it coming in from various sources, various multiple streams of income. But at the same time, we want to make sure we have no holes in the bottom of the bucket. And some of us have a lot of holes. Some of us have big holes. And so no matter how much comes in, we're always wanting more money. But the real problem is we're not sealing the holes in the bottom of our bucket. So maybe it would be a good time as you face a new season in your life to go over a budget. I think it would be wise for you to know how the money is coming in, what you need to spend it for, how is it going out, so that you're properly guarding that money that you have so the rest of your life can be the best of your life so you're not wringing your hands over being tremendously in debt and getting behind. And, of course, all of us would agree we have no control over this economy. So getting it is good, guarding it is good, but God says there's one other thing. So that your heart is filled with the fullness of God and joy, you need then to give your money. And to give it means how do I release it? Now, part of it is, will be, how do you spend your money? To spend it wisely. Spend it so the kingdom of God is going forward. Spending it on the basic needs of life. Investing in that which will add value to others. But it also means furthering the work of God through giving, through church, and other means. Now, when you do that, what happens? Watch this now. You've got the getting, you've got the guarding, and then you've got the giving. Well, if you want to give more... You've got to guard it to be able to give it. And once you start giving it, once you've guarded it, because now you can give it, God will even bring more into you so you'll get more. So the cycle actually gets better, and it'll help you not to owe anyone. It's interesting because if you really want to dig deeper into that verse, let me give you this thought. In the Greek, it means something a little bit more than that. It means something that has really helped me. It says, stop continually owing. I like that thought. Stop continually owing. So if you are and you're paying your bills on time, that's great. But really watch out so you don't keep adding more and more and more into debt. And the only way you can pay it off is by working longer and longer hours. And then more and more of your family has to work. And all of a sudden, you have more trouble. So try to move in the direction of getting out of debt. Here's an Old Testament reference that really speaks to that very strongly. It does. You know how the Old Testament Proverbs, they kind of really slap you side of the head. It says, the wicked borrows and does not pay back. But the righteous is gracious and gives. I don't really want to leave the impression that borrowing makes you wicked. It's the borrowing and not paying it back in the timely manner, remaining in that horrible state of debt. That makes the person out of line with what God wants because then you owe that person more, you become a servant of the lender more, then you have the ability then to be gracious and to be a giver. So number one would be if you want to have a great rest of your life, begin to rethink how you get your money, how you guard your money, how you give your money so that you can become more and more debt-free. And that will help you have a good end of life to do some really great things, things that God will be calling you to do, perhaps. All right, here's number two. Once you pay up, then you need to build up. I told you it would be easy for you to remember, and I did that so that these little pegs would be helpful to you. Go back to verse 8. It says, Owe nothing to anyone. And I like that word, anyone. It means we really need to be debt-free from everyone, family members and debtors, mortgage, all of that. But then it says, except to do this, though. To love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this. In other words, I want to give you a summary of all the commandments. They're all wrapped up in one phrase. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
And then it finishes up by saying, love does, does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So if you really want to build up someone, the best way you can do that is to look at them through the eyes of Christ and then look at them through the Word of God and using the Word of God, how can I live my life principally to be able to build up that other person? Now, it's interesting because I'm to stop owing, but I am to be in debt for the rest of my life that I'll never be able to repay of loving someone else, to really reach out and to try to add value to them in a very, very special way, to love them with all of my heart, soul, and mind. Now, there's another little word in here that really kind of struck me. You know, you know where it says, love one another? Listen carefully to this. Love one another. In the Greek, there are two words. One means love another. The another is of the same kind. Then there's another Greek word that means love another, and that's another of a different kind. Same kind, different kind. But when you read it here in the English, it just says love one another. Well, probably it could mean blanket love everybody, but technically, if you want to be really specific, it means to love someone of a different kind. Here's what I mean by that. I will get up here, and let's say that I gave the simple biblical plan of salvation that says that in order to go to heaven, you have to admit that you're a sinner, that you need a Savior, you can't save yourself, good works won't get you into heaven, you know that Jesus died and He rose again, and now you're counting on Him for His full forgiveness, you trust in Him, you accept Him as your Savior, you have everlasting life. And then we have Pastor Dennis comes up here or maybe 30 minutes later and he's given a little bit of a message and he repeats pretty much the same thing that I said, that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. You know what he just gave? He gave another gospel message. But when he gave it, it was another gospel message of the same kind. Let's say something else happens. I gave that message that salvation is by faith alone in Christ. And we have another maybe liberal speaker. He gets up and he says, you know, to go to heaven, you've got to trust in Christ. And we're beginning to cheer. And just before we do, and he says, but we also have to do good works to get saved and good works to stay saved. And if you don't do any good works and you probably didn't get saved because you didn't really promise God you'll do good works. So you front load the gospel, back load the gospel, you throw works in all of this. And then he steps down. I gave the gospel. He gave the gospel. I gave the gospel. He gave another gospel of a different kind. So this verse means to love people of another kind. So let's really bring it right down more specific. It's not talking about gospel presentations now. It's really talking about people. So would you go with me down memory lane? Maybe go through your little directory that you have in your phone. Maybe if you have something there in your home, a little sheet that has a directory of people that you know, family members and friends and neighbors and co-workers and church people. And as you go down through that litany of people, are there some irregular people in your life? people that are sandpaper people in your life, people that you just don't really want to be around, this verse would say to love people that are of a different kind than yourself. So now let's not be quite as specific. Listen to my list that I made for me. Because I, I want our church to grow. I'd love to have our church to be huge because if we're a bigger rock, we'll make a bigger splash and more people will be reached globally. I, I get all of that, but... I'm not driven by church growth. I'm driven really by church health. And so I really want to be known as a pastor who loves the Lord, loves his word, loves his wife, and mother-in-law since she's here, and loves you with all of my heart. I want to be known for that. But now to do that, I have to love others. So I made me this list, and I don't know if, if you would be on this list. I wanted to love people that have a different background than I have. I came from a blue-collar background, although my dad owned his own business. So it's kind of like a, a kind of a weird thing there when you're blue-collar, but yet you own your own business. I want to love people of different colors. Black, yellow, brown, whatever color. I don't want to be able to see their color. I want to be able to see their heart and what I might be able to do to help them to really know the Lord. I, 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 another belief thing. This became a little bit more difficult for me because I'm very quick to find myself very comfortable around people who fit my entire theological framework. And I'm really driven by sound doctrine, you know, and I feel so safe around them. And so all of a sudden I get into my theological holy huddle and I'm around them all the time. And, but I need to look at other people that, for one thing, they might not have had the privilege that I've had to be able to learn sound doctrine and to accept them on their journey of academic theological growth. It could be that they've had more, and maybe I could learn from them, but I've kind of got in my holy huddle, and I'm not willing to listen to them. How can I say I really love them if I'm not willing to listen to them? Am I afraid that they might twist my mind? Maybe they'll cause me to go deeper into what I do believe. And watch this. They may even bring me a convincing case 
that what I believe was wrong and I need to change my thinking. But if I never loved him enough to be able to listen at times, I could be in the deep weeds. So, of other beliefs. And now we can move into other faiths. I added one. Sometimes I find it easier to love people of certain ages. You know what I mean? There are some people that have such a hard time with children. They're nothing but ankle biters and rug rats, you know, and so they just don't want to be around little children. And I'm wondering how much they've been cheated out of what God has given to us if I don't love little children. And, and sometimes I, I, I will only listen to or respect people that have been down the road of life longer than I have, that have really proven themselves to be great. I, I don't want to do that. I want to be able to love people at every age that they have just in case that God might have given them something, a jewel that I might be able to gain. And the purpose of me gaining from whatever ages and stages of their life, whatever their colors are, whatever their beliefs are, the whole thing is I want to make sure that I don't miss out on one bit of blessing truth that God wants me to have, not so that I have more tools in my toolbox, it's so that whatever I might have that will make me a better servant of the Lord to be able to take and do more for the glory of God. So if I really say... I want to have the rest of my life, the best of my life, then I need to really make sure I don't compartmentalize everybody down to that I can only have fellowship with someone if I was in a phone booth with them because that's the only amount of people that can fit into my little box. And I hope that would be the same with you. So we really want to build up one another and to be a part of that. And it says here, oh, no man, anything or nothing except just love and I would love for our church to always be known as a church that loves and how important that is. Well, let's go to number three. Paul says to pay up. He says to build up. Now he says to wake up. And I, I alluded to this verse uh, pretty close to the beginning of my sermon, but let's go back to it again, all right? We want to wake up. And you go back to the verse, it says, Owe no man anything except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this you shall not commit adultery, murder, steal, covet, and if there's any other, it's summed up in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Then he says, do this, knowing the time. Now, it doesn't mean on my clock or my watch, okay? The time means the age, the stage, the season of where we live now. That it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now, that means right now, salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. So let me ask a question. Are you ready for this? You don't have to stand up. You don't have to say anything out loud, but you can wiggle your hand if you'd like. How many of you have trusted Christ as your personal Savior in the last two years? Okay, got a couple up here. How many trusted Christ in the last five years? Would you raise your hand? Okay. How many trusted Christ in the last 10 years? Would you raise your hand? How many trusted Christ in the last 30 years? Trusted your Christ? You trust, raise your hand. How many trusted Christ in the last 50 years? How many over 50 years ago would you raise your hand? All right, That means that you are closer to heaven than the time you believe. So the distance to heaven for you probably is a lot closer than when you trusted Christ as your Savior. Now why am I saying that? This is basically saying when it talks about wake up out of sleep, it's really talking about spiritual lethargy or spiritual laziness or spiritual deadness. Now, I pondered about that. Now, why would Paul say this at this particular time? Do this. Wake up out of that because your salvation is closer than it was then. I thought, why did he say that to these Romans? Now, here's what I think. I had to take it back to a timeline. When he was writing to this, this church at Rome wasn't celebrating their 50th jubilee. This church at Rome was only a few decades old at the very, very most that's how young this church at Rome was. And now he's telling this church at Rome, you need to wake up. Which now tells me that probably every New Testament church and every Bible-believing and teaching church even today, and maybe even, I love you, I love you, even us, we could have spiritual laziness today going on. And he says to wake up out of that. And sometimes, I don't know, but... Um, have you ever fallen asleep and then someone wakes you up and you say, oh, I must have fallen asleep. Has that ever happened to you before? I must have fallen asleep. Someone had to kind of wake you up. I have a lot of stories about that where I'm just falling asleep and something happens. Carol drops a pot. Someone steps on our cat. Something happens and, and I'm wide awake. I woke up three of you just now. Something happened to wake me up. 
My question to you is, what do you think it's going to take God to wake you up from any spiritual lethargy that you might have? What will it be? Some people would say, when God did this, when God took this away, when God had me lose that. Or sometimes people might say, I was kind of lazy, but all of a sudden God really blessed me and I realized I didn't deserve that. How, what a great God I have. And that woke him up. My question to, though to you is this, what is going to wake you up from any spiritual lethargy? You're probably thinking, aren't you? Maybe a better question would be this. How would you know if you have spiritual lethargy? Have you thought about that? Some people could be asleep and they don't even know it. Did you read? I don't, I don't know how these things come to me because I don't surf Facebook. I don't surf the web. I, just, I don't even have time to go surfing. Okay, And yet, I got this article that talked about this young lady who walked in her sleep 12 miles and they found her. Did any of you see that on the internet? All right. All right. Who did? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Thank you because I don't want people to think I made this up. This gal was in her own physical sleep of lethargy for a 12-mile hike to get to wherever she got. So that means we can be in lethargy and we don't know it. I think sometimes spiritual lethargy can show up in faithfulness in our quiet time with the Word. Do we have time in the Word every day? And I mean that we don't raise up, I had my time in the Word. It's because I've had time in the Word, I've gotten closer to the Lord. That time in the Word gave me that spiritual excitement, that spiritual energy, that spiritual reminder, that spiritual refocusing that caused me to have a little bit more of a wake-up call to the reality of God in my life on a moment-by-moment basis. So maybe it's we've gotten soft to the Bible. We've allowed Facebook time to take over Bible time. And I'm not anti that. I'm just saying let's just put things in priorities and a little bit more on top. Maybe it could be spiritual lethargy as we kind of come to church and we go through the most, yeah, I, I put my time in church, I did the right thing, it was pretty good, I picked up a couple little things that kind of encouraged me, but then next week something else happens that keeps us from coming to church. In other words, we kind of go with the flow of the quickest thing that we then begin to justify in our life. So spiritual lethar- lethargy sets in. And so Paul is speaking to the church at Rome, wake up you guys, because your salvation is closer. Now that salvation, now catch this, I'm going to get a little deep for you for some of you, and I, I want to do this to help us all be on the same page. You have three stages. You have what we call salvation, you have sanctification, and then you have glorification. I am saved, and once I'm saved, God doesn't immediately cause us to go to heaven. He leaves us here for sanctification. What is sanctification? It's where God is setting us apart, making us pure and holy for a purpose for Him, and it's a growing thing. We're growing in the Lord. We're becoming more and more like Christ. We go from salvation, He leaves us here to become more and more like Christ. Not just so I I look like Christ and I act like Christ, I'm also going to be passionate to tell others about Christ so that we're all on this page of Christ-likeness. But it's not that. We go to the next stage, and that happens at glorification. Salvation is in the past. Sanctification is happening right now. I pray this message is sanctifying all of us, growing us to become more like Him, and waking up, building up, and uh, paying up. But then it's because glorification is going to come in the future. And that's what it's saying. Our salvation, our glorification is coming so much sooner at any moment. Now, how could that be? Well, there's two ways that that could happen. Number one is the one that we don't don't often like to think about. That salvation could come to us, our eternal salvation, the moment when we're in heaven, the moment that we die. The moment your heart stops beating and they cannot bring you life again and you're a Christian, you are in heaven right then. Your salvation is basically completed because you're in heaven. The second time that people don't often remember is this. Jesus Christ said that he could come back at any moment. In a twinkling of an eye, he could come. Now, he won't come to the earth, but he'll snatch us all up. So at any moment, the Lord could come back and wake us up at that moment, take us up at that time. And so I'd like to be really ready. I had a Bible teacher say this to me one time, and it convicted me so badly. And uh, it stayed with me enough all these years to be able to share it with you, and here it is. If Jesus was to come for you, where will he find you and what will he find you doing when he comes for you? Would you be happy for him to come for you and find you doing what you should be doing or doing what you shouldn't be doing? And so I got thinking about that. I would want the Lord to find me preaching, sharing, praying, encouraging you, serving you, helping you, doing what's right. Being strong during persecution, taking a stand, studying the word, whatever it might be, I'd rather have him not find me in a situation of lying, immorality, stealing, 
a state of spiritual lethargy. I hope that wouldn't be the case. So we need to wake up. But that's not all. We've got a couple more to go through, and so let's look at those. He also says to gear up, and I like this because it really speaks to us here. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.